In the realm of scientific progress, transformative breakthroughs resonate and permeate our daily lives, deepening our understanding of the world we inhabit. At the American Physical Society, we take a pride in shedding light on the diverse backgrounds, unique journeys, and captivating stories that shape our vibrant community in their relentless pursuit of knowledge and discovery. Since our inception in 1899, APS has been at the forefront of advancing the frontiers of physics, disseminating knowledge across the globe for the betterment of all. In this spirit, APS serves as a beacon illuminating the lifelong dedication of remarkable individuals in their unwavering quest to impact the world around us. Within the ever-evolving tapestry of scientific inquiry, the future lies in the hands of early career scientists. They infuse the field with fresh perspectives, innovative concepts, and novel approaches breathing new life into the pursuit of scientific excellence. APS takes immense pride in providing avenues for recognition, networking, and growth within this dynamic demographic of physicists. The George E. Valley Jr. Prize celebrates an early career luminary whose scientific contributions hold the promise of a profound impact on the field. We are honored to present this award to Jeff Pennington for the computation of the quantum entropy of an evaporating black hole and its radiation. So if I'm needing to just think and get back to basics, try to just work out a problem, I like to get outside, I like to get away from stuffy offices and so on. Obviously it's fun to say to my friends who aren't physicists, oh yeah, I proved talking wrong. I guess I always found the question of, of trying to unify quantum mechanics and gravity together in some way It'll look very cool even, even before I, I understood how either of those things worked on their own. But of course there are scenarios where, where the two come together irreconcilably and those are, those are sort of the great mysteries. So the laws of physics, the, the, the laws of physics that we understand are fundamentally reversible. So what this means is that any information that exists at one time is always also secretly there at another time, even if it becomes completely inaccessible. So in principle, if you drop an egg and let it break, then you can press a rewind button and, and allow the egg to come back together and unbreak. But for Stephen Hawking claimed that for black holes, there is no rewind button. There is no way to go back from an evaporated black hole and see what was there before it formed. Over the last few decades, we've really become convinced, or the most people have become convinced that, that Hawking wasn't right, that actually black holes are just like ordinary objects. In 2019, as a graduate student, I'd been working my, with my advisor on, on various ideas to do with quantum gravity and quantum information. And some of those ideas had to do with what the radiation of a black hole would look like if, if information wasn't lost. Some other ideas involved, involved similar phenomenon just showing up in, in quantum gravity. And at some point, I was sitting down and I, I suddenly realized, hang on, what if these are the same thing going on? And large parts of the black hole information problem. So that was a pretty crazy and exciting moment. And I spent probably the next six months working very hard to, to try to make it work and, and get a paper out. I think in most projects, you have moments where it's discouraging and it feels like it's going nowhere and so on. That's probably one of the few projects I've had where I never felt at all discouraged because I knew from the get-go how exciting it would be if it worked out.
I have a tendency to, to go out my office window and climb up on the top of a roof and just sit there. You can just really get some sense of serenity and peace and uh, let your brain try to process stuff. It's normally at the end of the day, if something's too complicated or confusing, you need to think about it a different way. So I think I was on a plane flight when I first decided I was satisfied with the co uh, computation and that, that I had the right answer for computing the entropy of a black hole as it's evaporating and, and that I could, yeah, I could confidently say that this, this really works. So that was obviously pretty exciting. The, the cool thing about what I do is that you get to just try to explore, try to find the, the deepest algorithm, the deepest principles that the, the universe runs on. The information problem is certainly not over. There is a lot more to say and will, it will inspire interesting physics for a long time to come. Obviously, growing up, Stephen Hawking was someone I was very aware of, a very inspirational figure. Working on this stuff just made me appreciate the brilliance of his original insight and how important that has been to, to 50 years of physics since. Yeah, it feels very cool to have, have contributed to adding something real, something, something building on the, the huge epic achievements that have been made before and adding something on top that, that genuinely lets us see a little deeper how the universe works. A career devoted to physics research is a testament to dedication and perseverance, demanding an unyielding commitment to the relentless pursuit of knowledge. Yet when this endeavor is complemented by the ability to captivate audiences, inspire students, and serve as an astute mentor, a physicist transcends into a paragon of comprehensive excellence. The Julius Edgar Lilienfeld Prize honors those who have not only left an indelible mark on physics, but have also mastered the art of communicating its intricacies to diverse audiences. We proudly present this distinction in 2024 to Edward Rakikov for pioneering and outstanding contributions to cosmology and particle physics and an exceptional ability to communicate the extraordinary developments at the intersection of physics and cosmology to the general public. I grew up in New Orleans, and uh, there was no air conditioning anywhere in the neighborhood. So I went in the public library because it was cool, temperature-wise. Then one day I wandered into the science section and the librarian came over and pulled me away and said, no, 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 that's not the children's section. You can't go into that section. So science was forbidden, mysterious, something that I couldn't do, therefore irresistible. So when, uh, if I tell people I'm a cosmologists, occasionally they say, oh yeah, you're a cosmetologist. But there's a difference. Cosmology is the makeup of the universe, and cosmetology, well, that's the universe of makeup. <laughs> so cosmology and particle physics was largely separated when I started in the late 1970s. At that time, cosmology was not considered a very reputable field of science. You know, they said, oh, there's no data, it's all imagination, it's all theory, where's the data? So I didn't think there was any way to connect them. But later, when I started graduate school, I realized that there was a way to connect the inner space of the quantum with the outer space of the cosmos. And that's because in the Big Bang, the temperatures, densities, and pressures were comparable to the quantum realm. So the temperature of the early universe that I study is comparable to the temperatures that are created in particle accelerators. I'd like to describe the conditions of the early universe as the primordial soup. 
I think it's a good way to think of it in the ingredients of the primordial soup. All of the ingredients that we produce at accelerators, the quarks, the leptons, now the Higgs boson, all of the photons, everything that we produce, the particle zoo was present in the early universe. In 1983, I was offered the opportunity to start a group at Fermilab, Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, a particle physics laboratory, to do astrophysics. And we kept thinking, surely there's going to be adult supervision at some point, but uh, you know, we, we turned out okay. There had never been an international meeting on particle physics and cosmology. So we started a meeting in 1984 called Inner Space and Outer Space. And I think that was the coming out party uh, for the field of particle cosmology. Today, it's uh, difficult to find a particle physicist who does not understand and does not work in cosmology. It's difficult to find a cosmologist who knows nothing about particle physicists. They used to not talk to each other. Now, it, they're so intertwined, you can't tell them apart. It's uh, very rewarding to me to look back and think that we played a role in really starting a field. I think physics is fun. It's the most enjoyable thing that I do. You know, I just can't wait to get into my office and do physics. I feel a responsibility to uh, talk to a broader audience, as broad an audience as possible, about the wonders of physics. What excites me about what I'm doing? I try to tell the audience of the class that it's your universe too. They have a right to know what the universe is about, and for them to view science as a mystery or something that's not important is not a recipe for the future and I have the responsibility to convey the knowledge that we have gained. And I think that if I can do it, then people should feel confident that they can do it also. The APS Medal for Exceptional Achievement in Research symbolizes contributions of the highest caliber, ushering us into a deeper understanding of the universe. The APS Medal, our society's most prestigious honor, is reserved for individuals whose lifelong dedication to scientific inquiry has profoundly transformed the field of physics. This distinction recognizes the embodiment of unwavering intellectual curiosity throughout the individual's career. In 2024, this prestigious award is conferred upon Stuart Parkin, a luminary whose incisive experiments and major discoveries in Spintronics led to a revolution in data storage and memory. Stuart's indomitable spirit of inquiry has forever altered our perception of the world around us. I believe, which many people think is crazy, that one should aim for the impossible. And then I think oftentimes one unexpectedly can do the impossible without the magnetic disk drive and without the spin valve sensor. This wouldn't be possible. The modern world would not be possible. The very, very first, um, I'm super old, the very first electronic calculators came along. And in England, there was a, a Sinclair calculator. So when I was a student and undergraduate, I think I bought one of these. It could do very simple mathematical, algebraic equations. That's all it could do. But it was, uh, I, I bought one of the very, very earliest, simplest computers, if you like. And I always was fascinated by that possibility. I think it's fascinating how during my lifetime, the technologies have continued to evolve to ever impress capabilities, which I think is not something that one can anticipate. And so my whole career has been connected to the idea that we could improve the means of storing digital data. I took up a postdoc in Indonesia Rams Laboratory and the University of Paris, and I went there to work on organic superconductors. They'd just been discovered, 
And so I went to IBM as a postdoc to work on these organic superconductors. But after a couple of years, IBM decided that they no longer wanted to work on that and that they um, proposed I work on some area of magnetism. So I, I, I was actually quite interested in this and I was happy to, do, happy to try and uh, find some interesting science to be done on the fundamental aspects of magnetic materials with potential application to some of the technologies that IBM had, in particular magnetic disk drives. Very interesting, at that time there were always people predicting the demise of the magnetic disk drive technology. It's all based on how many magnetic bits can you store per unit area. And then people would predict, oh, it's not possible to go beyond this limit because it's physically impossible. And once it was operational, then the new manager, who wasn't really magnetism, said to me, oh, we need to hire somebody who's a real expert. You're not an expert. So basically the whole lab was given away to a new scientist. I believe if you have a challenge, you can always find a solution. Turns out at that time, IBM had like a warehouse of um, instruments that were abandoned because nobody wanted them anymore and I built my own little tiny sputtering system out of spare parts and my own design and it turns out that was fantastic because this tiny system ena enabled me to explore vast numbers of materials all by myself and one technician in the next few years and that's how I was able to uh, basically invent this spin valve material and, and discover a lot of interesting uh, magnetic properties of these multi-layers that nobody else had seen previously. I was able to invent a sensor device based, it's one of the very very earliest devices working on the principle of controlling the flow of electrons in which you control the value of their spin and with that we could improve our ability to read information in a magnetic disk drive um, by a thousand times or even ten thousand times after that invention in the following perhaps decade. So that basically enabled all digital information in the world to be stored in magnetic disk drives and there was a point in time in the mid uh, maybe 2007 where one year's supply of all the magnetic disk drives in the world could store all information that all knowledge we had since the beginning of mankind and in some sense that was the beginning of the digital world. So it's fantastic to have impact, which I think you can see in the real world today. You have to choose a field in which you can see that there are interesting problems, interesting problems to be solved. This exploration of this unknown territory will reap enormous benefits in the future. If there was a clear path, it would be so uninteresting. And this is what I always try to tell my PhD students here, look, if, it's, if you know the path, it's not very interesting. If, it's, if you don't have a path, but you recognize it's a fantastic challenge and you can overcome it, that's, that's makes the whole, um, that makes it so exciting. And that's what excites, excites me.